invite to the stage a man who is indeed a legend in these parts, Mohammed Alaba. Mohammed, where are you? And please join me here by the fireside. It's great to see you. Great to see you. Use your imagination, Mohammed. Here we are, seated by the fire. Uh, and use your imagination in a different way, because as we uh, talk about your extraordinary journey uh, as a businessman, as an investor, I want you to begin right back at the beginning. I think I'm right in saying that your father, Captain Dadao, you were born in Dubai, but Dubai was a very different place from the one we know. So paint me a picture of what growing up in Dubai in the 50s, the early 60s, was like? Oh, by the way, this one's for you. I have one. I'd forgotten that. There you go. Well, thank you so much. First of all, uh, Stephen, the idea of sitting by the fire is the closest thing to my heart, so Great. don't do that to me. Um, I think if I were to answer that a little differently, I think you know the thing that resonates with me is, is my, my mother having her kitchen under the tree. Mm. That was our kitchen, actually. Her kitchen was under the palm tree. And, and that is really what resonate with me that, uh, and a lot of people ask me, actually, before my dad passed away, they said, Muhammad, did your dad come and visit some of these amazing hotels that you built? Yeah. And I said, I, I worry about him because none of our people actually used to walking on these, you know, polished marble and granite. Life is very complex for them, especially that my dad didn't read and didn't write. But as a ship captain, he spoke Swahili, he spoke uh, Urdu, he spoke Farsi, and he spoke uh, Arabic. Uh, so my mother cooking under the tree is what you should really remember. That's where we came from. No, that, really that, that, that's an extraordinary And, and that's why thing. whatever we do these days, Stephen, we're just so grateful that, you know, look, look, what, look what we do in our lives, you know. It's, forget about our profit size, billions, but just, you know, the, the, God is so kind to take us from one place to another. And it's really, it humbles me every single morning. But you are um, a builder. You know, you, you have been involved in the building of this extraordinary place from the beginning. So I, I really do still, I want you to paint me a picture of what it looked like. Uh, at the beginning of all of this, you know, you, you schooled eventually in America, then you came back to Dubai, but even then, I guess in what would be around the early 90s, what did it actually physically look like then? Well, I, th I think, I think the cities were quite, quite basic, simple cities, and, and I think we had leaders that, that basically, like our CEOs, who basically said, listen, we might do some exciting things around this place. Are you guys going to join the, the trip or the vision? Mm. And it was just try it. We, we really tried this thing and it worked. Um, and life was much, much simpler than what we have. And then after trying a few things and then you realize they really do work, they say, wow, let's do more. Let's do more. Now it's amazing that the whole region is trying to do, to do more. And we're all wanting, you know, we're all public companies and we have quarterly results and we have to do more and more. So I would say that from simple life to a very complex life. People know you for all sorts of things, but maybe most people internationally, if they were to name one project associated with you, with Imar, it would be the Burj Khalifa and it what is it, 820 something meters high? It, it's an extraordinary thing. It involved ambition and scale and doing something that had never quite been done before. How important was that project in just raising the global profile of Imar and of Dubai and what you were embarking upon, the building of a massive new global hub? Today, you can look at it, Stephen, and you can really say that, wow, it's part of a vision, uh, and then, you know, it's um, creating a, an incredible landmark for the city, putting the city on the global scene. But honestly, during that period of time, the vision was blurry. Let's just try this thing, because mm. <laughs> how can you put the tallest building in the world 
in the desert. I mean, how, how, will, how can the numbers make sense? How can you put the largest mall where 100 million will come and visit it a year and make a lot of money? Honestly, no matter what number we ran, it was very humble expectation that let's try this and I hope we can be recognized in the world that we are decent people that, you know, and unfortunately, I remember as we designing the building, it was all the disasters of terrorism and Muslims and Arabs. And then I was worried that somebody would say Arabs destroy buildings and one guy want to build a tall building. <laughs> so, so honestly, it was really, uh, it was good wishes. Are you a, a natural risk taker? Uh, I think I am. I think you are too. Yeah. I, I, I just wonder how much of your mind is, is preoccupied with, what if this goes wrong? What happens to me if all of this fails? Well, at, uh, at 65 now, and uh, next month I'll be 66, uh, yes, I think of risk a lot because I've gone through a lot. But when I was in my 45, uh, just push. But watch your liquidity position because I was in Singapore and I was hit with a baseball bat in uh, 1997 and it could, could have killed me. And I don't forget the liquidity. Don't talk to the banks. Please don't talk to the banks. Make sure your balance sheet is not efficient and you don't have a lot of loans. And if you don't, if you cannot operate that way, don't do business. But I stay away from banks and I try to really think of, I'm, I'm a paranoid person. What can go wrong? So yesterday we had a big meeting actually in, in my management team with, uh, with my management team in Amar. The whole two hours about what can go wrong with our business. And of course, Dubai is flying, UAE is flying, but this is the time to think, what can go wrong? Well, I'm intrigued now. What can go wrong? When you, you and your yeah. mates were yeah. talking about it yeah, yeah, yesterday, yeah. What, what are the... Believe it or not, the biggest risk we have is contractors. Execution and the health and the balance sheet of contractors, because contractors do good work for us. They do good work for other people. Other people don't pay them on time. They have financial issues. Our projects have financial issues while making sure that our next payment, uh, we have a bond that's coming in about two years, and we've decided we'll pay it, pay it in full, and we don't want to renew, interest rate is too high, cash position is good. We'll borrow after seven years maybe when interest rate is, is lower, if it comes lower. Mm. Look at um, Dubai, look at Abu Dhabi, look at the Emirates generally. Are you pleased with the way it has evolved and developed over the last 30, 40 years? I mean, be honest with me. Are, are there things you worry about? I'm, I'm, of course, I'm happy with the progress because I think we in the Arab world, we need, we need to have a shining example for other countries in the region to follow. Because I really believe that we are 400 million people, 500 if I include Iran with us, and we only have one hub called Dubai. While, you know, I think we said the last times that if you look at Europe, they have Munich, they have London, they have Paris, they have so many amazing Milan, Rome, they've got, and, and the Arab world needs that. So I think UAE had to move so other countries move forward. That's why it's amazing, all the great work that's going on in Saudi Arabia. And I hope the same thing happens in Qatar, same thing happens in, 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 in Egypt uh, as well. Um, I think it was, it was in the UAE, I'm glad that the, the, the growth was, was reasonable, and I'm glad we had these bumps kind of slow it down a little bit. You mean bit. bumps are good for you sometimes? Uh, yeah, well, you know what, it, it <laughs> teaches us, right? Right. We are careless people, um, and we forget the lesson too. So, <laughs> uh, so I would say that, that I think it was, it, was, it was at a good level. What one concern I have, and I keep repeating to my colleagues in the government, is that how big do we want to be? Great question. I like, I like how Singapore does business. I know the world is not perfect. But we need, and I, you know what? I'm not in the government. They probably have a plan anyway. Well, they, that, we, you know? we spoke to the Minister or, of Economy yeah. earlier. You uh, were not here to he hear it, but he said, my God, I have a plan. We develop a 10-year vision for our tourism I, and hospitality. That is the only thing. Because I need to know how much power will we will need, how much yeah. water we'll need, how much garbage collection we'll need, what are we going to do with this garbage, especially that now we convert garbage to, to energy, population size. You know, how can we really create a beautiful environment and we keep it beautiful? That's really my concern. Can, can you? I mean... I think you can, of course. I think you can. I, and I, with the leadership yeah. that we have, they're so passionate about this country. 
I think it's doable. I, I used a word earlier with the minister, which uh, he, he wasn't quite so keen on, but I, I talked about saturation. Is it possible to imagine a point when it, you know, when we're talking about expansion, we're talking about construction, growth in sectors like, you know, hotels and tourism, is it possible to imagine a saturation point when given the size, the geographical size, the demographic size of this place, that you have reached a saturation point? If you ask me four years ago, I would tell you, yes, I'm worried. If you ask me now, knowing the people I know in the senior position in the government, no, it won't happen because these guys are awake. They'll make mistakes. We all make mistakes, but they're awake. Mm. Let's get to the nitty gritty for many people here, and that is the future of uh, hotels, hospitality in this part of the world. You're, you're a very canny investor. You, you, uh, we all I'm, a, I'm a hard-working, lucky investor. <laughs> I work so hard, people say I'm successful. I'm not successful. I just... Well, I'm if you're not successful... I'm grinding uh, seven days all yeah. the time, all the time. And you know what? You succeed and they say, wow, he is so successful. Ask Mark how much I chase him. Well, you no, know what? If you're not seriously. successful, I'd like a little piece of your not success because it sounds pretty good to me. Um, I have a lot of that. Too. But, but uh, tell me honestly, uh, your assessment right now of, of the potential uh, in, the, in the hotel and tourism hospitality sector here. I mean, you invest a lot in real estate. Do hotels excite you or not really? Of course, they are very exciting, uh, <laughs> exciting business. Uh, so today we have about 12,000 rooms. Uh, so what, $3.5 billion of, uh, of investment. So it's, it's a big, uh, big piece. Is it, is it something you see a lot more, you know, real expansion potential? Uh, or, or do you, you feel you're getting to a point where you've got enough? Yeah. See, when, when we, for example, we have about 16 hotels in, on the coastline of Croatia. When we do that, we, we focus mainly on hospitality. And that's an amazing market, by the way, because supply and demand is very interesting in Croatia. But when we do business with the re our real estate, we abuse our hotels. Where you we abuse them? We abuse them, yes, in a nice way. <laughs> you can see how we do this. If you were to think of any city, imagine a beautiful street without that luxury hotel on the street. So we stick our hotels in our development only to enhance value of real estate around it. But we never tell Mark that we're making so much money around this hotel. Imagine the value of real estate around Ritz Paris without Ritz. So we do this very well. And you know how much we make out of per square meter of at least four buildings around a hotel? 30%. So I do business. I love hotels. It makes money. But the amount of the environment around it enhancing That's value. Really interesting. So us. you see hotels as sort of a, a mix between a beacon, a magnet, something that thank has you. a huge knock-on effect. Thank you. Thank you. But well, what makes don't it thank me. Thank but, yourself. But you're, it's your idea. Steve, but Steve, you know what, what makes also this business interesting? I'm sure the audience, they know this. You know, only almost 4% of the world population traveled. 4% out of the 7 point whatever billion. So tourism have not started yet. But we have a responsibility towards Earth, towards our cities, because sustainability issues are a big, big challenge. And honestly, we are not doing we are not doing in that doing well in that area. All of us. So all so us. that's what I'm thinking. I'm, I'm you know, I'm glad I started where I did with you and your parents, your mum cooking outside, your dad captaining the Dow, going across these beautiful waters. In, in, you know, without sounding patronizing, a very simple life, a very pure life, and a life very much in touch with the environment around them and with nature. And let us be honest, you know, the environment you have created in a place like Dubai cuts that connection between the people and the natural world right around them on their doorstep. Is that a problem? You know, when we all talk about sustainability and a, a long-term future for us as a species, do you worry about the cutting of that connection? Well, you know, evolution of human beings, that's just the evolution of society, but can we really do this evolution? If you look at some of our big master plans and, and all the services that we provide to make sure that you really live as a family, that you really live quality life, that you are secure, that, that your kids, 
can walk to school. Mm. Um, I think we are creating the same old neighborhoods, but it's just in a new language because AI and, and technology is changing the way we live and the way we communicate with our with our parents. And I hope, I hope soon, you know, America and Europe can solve their election problems and AI will select the best person to run <laughs> countries because, because, yeah. <laughs> you know, because uh, things are not going well. Well, you know? uh, yeah, you make some very interesting points there, which would be great for a hard talk discussion. Uh, I'm not sure I want AI and the machines actually... I will, I will do that with my clothes because they will check your credit card, uh, yeah. they will check your you, YouTube channel, they will check your face, uh, Facebook, what you watch, and, I, and they say, this is a good guy, this is a bad guy. Well, <laughs> yeah. They're... And they'll check your phone bill to say, oh, he calls his mother three times a week. This yeah. guy doesn't call his mother <laughs> like once a month. Well, this is the good well, guy. Well, <laughs> you know what? There are pros and cons to this sort of surveillance society, and, and we could definitely talk about that. What I, I'm going to try and elegantly do is, is turn that little discussion about uh, societies which do use surveillance, and, and I, you know, I don't know if we have Chinese friends in the room, but China is using amazing amounts of technology to keep tabs on its citizens, you know, and you can discuss whether that's a positive or a negative. But I'm just wondering for you as a, 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 an investor in real estate and in hotels, whether you, as you look beyond the Middle East region and look at the world, whether you take into account, uh, you know, systems of government, uh, the nature of government, when you place new investments. Does it matter to you what kind of political environment you're going into? The truth? No. Because I used to think I was a developer, but I'm not a developer. I think everybody wants to have a piece of New York in their country. Everybody wants to have a piece of Dubai in their country. Everybody wants to have a piece of London in their country. So we feel that we are civilized people. That's how we started in Dubai. And I get approached by good, good people, honestly, that I think they want me to do a real estate project. And then we do political risk, financial risk, credit risk, and it's all red. Albania is a very good example, by the way. Mm. And these people, they just want to be part of the civilized world. And it's our duty to do that as well. Bes beside the money, I, I truly believe this, that we in Dubai, in the UAE, we want it to be recognized that we are civilized people. And I think if we have that, this ability, we should also contribute. We should also do. But we realize that actually there is no political issues. There is no crime. There are no gangs. And there is an incredible IRR. And Albania is an incredible example for me. So well, honestly, I go everywhere. I have a big, huge project in Minsk. Big. Ah, well, I'm glad yeah. you mentioned that. I was going to say, are there any places in the world right now, you know, on a values basis you wouldn't invest and I was again well, you've yeah. done it for me but I was yeah. going to raise your significant investment in Belarus yes which right now with the best will in the world is a very closed repressive society which of course is allied very closely to Moscow and Vladimir Putin has all sorts of long-term political risk attached to it and yet there you are going in and, yeah. and building something huge and and to be honest with you <laughs> I mean, this is really, one day I'm going to write a book about this. <laughs> because it's sanctioned, right? We opened the most advanced, beautiful sales center in the world. We didn't start selling. First, we built a beautiful park. Uh, we have a, a lake on our site. We spent a few million dollars, just public park for the people, and we invited people to say, we want to gift you a park. People went crazy. Our sales is incredible. Our margin is great. Okay, small margin. But I think people in Minsk 
I don't care about politics. Yeah, but they, they how want can you say you don't care? I mean, at the very, hang developer. on, Mohammed. At the I very same time, developer. what can I do? You're right? building them a park, and I dare say they're very happy about that. But you yeah. know that they've locked up all of the political opposition. I'm if you go out on the street, that. I don't get involved. That's not my business. Couldn't Honestly. care less. I know. I mean, listen. I mean, you know, America locked them in Morocco. I mean, America locked them. You know, you know the game. I'm not involved in that. I don't want to do that. I just go there. I want to deal with the people. I want to show them a beautiful life. I want to show them that we're honest developers, that we love what we do. Mm. And, and the rest is not my business, honestly. That's very candid, very honestly put. But it, I, I mentioned the phrase political risk. I mean, there is a political risk in all of this because Belarus arguably you know, is on the edge of instability. So you've got to calculate that too. I'm in Belarus every month. I know much more. I don't know how, when was the last time you were in Belarus. Well, that's a great question. Uh, sadly, the uh, <laughs> sadly, the president of Belarus currently doesn't want to be on hard talk, so I'm I'm not. Well, because because Steve, because what you do in hard talk is so incredible. I really admire well, you, by well, the way. Thank and you. I watch you all the time, and I say, <laughs> my God, I like how this guy goes after these guys. <laughs> well. Flattery will get you everywhere, so I, that's lovely. Thank you very much. Um, seriously, I, it's just a, it's a really interesting way of approaching your business. You, you, you have to, in your view, you just have to distance yourself from all the political noise. And you believe that, that your investments bring a public good with them. No. You, don't forget the mic. No, I, I just want to say that, honestly, I'll be honest with you guys. You know, most developers in the world have bad reputation. Because they make so much money, but they don't deliver good quality. They want to cheat the public. And they make so much money. And plus, they, you guys do something else. You pay us two years in advance, especially in this part of the world. I will never pay Mercedes two years in advance. <laughs> so we are so lucky, and I'm so grateful that people trust us. I, I, you cannot believe the, the days when we launch a project in Minsk and look at people's faces to say, Thank God we found somebody we trust mm. to give me a home. And it's okay, it's $60,000 per home because these are small, unfinished. But honestly, I'm very emotional about this stuff. And I really do it from my heart, mm. honestly. And I'm so thrilled that I can do what I do. And Talk the politics is not my business, honestly. Talking about your heart and uh, your obvious passion. Uh, I mean, you've proved yourself many times over, and your success is, as I said at the very beginning, legendary around here. Would you say you're as ambitious, you're as hungry as you were, say, 20 years ago? What's going on in here? Yeah, I think, uh, I think it's the same. I've been talking to my son that I should slow down. Um, but no, I think I'm so excited. Was he uh, suggesting that might be a good idea? All the time. No. Yeah. Uh, but no, uh, honestly, I'm just so grateful and, and therefore I'm excited. I see new things. Uh, I'm doing new things and, it's, and it just keeps me happy. What, what uh, you've got, God knows, a real global perspective. What excites you the most right now? This week, uh, it's different. Uh, this week, I'm really excited about um, starting a, um, a poultry feed plant in Addis Ababa, outside Addis Ababa. Right. Because Americana is in the chicken business, and uh, in the Arab world, we have shortage of uh, uh, chicken feed. And by the way, for those we all eat chicken, the cost for each chicken, 65% of the cost of the chicken is the feed, you, the feed. And none of us in the Arab world is able to produce the feed because we don't produce soya, we don't produce corn. So I think I found it in, in uh, Ethiopia. Huh. Final question, because I'm just looking at the clock, but I just want to get a sense of your broad, big picture mood about the future of the world, because yours is a company that depends, you know, on a, to a certain degree on stability. You say you don't take account of day-to-day -day politics and whatever, but, you know, if you are of the pessimistic frame of mind, it's easy to feed your pessimism at the moment. We've got a big war in Europe. We have a global sort of cost of living and energy crisis, which means many of the poor and disadvantaged are really struggling right now in many parts of the world. You know, we see conflict, we see hunger. Do you feel good about the future of this world that you've made such a success of? Or are you, do you have worries right now? No, I worry because, you know, I have friends in Ukraine where life is in a shamble. 
you know, they're close to me. And, and we say, oh, God, God, look down at us. And I don't want to blame anybody, but can, can you look down at us? And these are people who are trying to survive even before the war. Who will repair this country? We know all these wars, there is nothing but loss on both sides. We know it. America spent 16 trillion. And now the Americans have to pay the, the Americans have to pay the bill. I don't know if they can. All right. So I worry, but on top of, of that, I really worry about natural disasters. I mean, what's going on mm -hmm. in what happened in Morocco, what happened in Libya, is, is you know, there's more to come. Uh, and something I really want to be proud of and I want to show you, I hope I put it on social media soon, um, that for the past few months, I've been starting a project uh, called Housing the Poor. And I was in China just a week before that uh, to really, I was, able, I was able to find a house for about, about $900. Uh, and my aim was I want to buy 2,000 of them. I put them in a warehouse because they're foldable. And I said, the next Turkey happens and, you know, and, and unfortunately, mm. Morocco happened before. Yeah. So this stuff really worries me. Uh, what I can do about it, I think I'm going to go ahead and buy four, 4,000 of these homes. I'll warehouse them somewhere. And if a disaster hit, you know, I can, I'm sure the UAE will help me. I ship them on cargo just, just, to yeah. help, just to help somebody. And, and you know, with, when it comes to, to, to wars, of course, I wish I could help. But it's a catastrophe that, that, you know, we waste so much money. We destroy human life. We should, we should help. We take this money to build and progress and grow. And, but, but, you know, that's with the politician. That's you know, above well, my pay grade. When it comes to building, you have done more than most. No, it, it's been such a me. pleasure talking thank to you. I think you, the, the intimacy with the fireside <laughs> re, re, really worked. And but, the only thing Steve, I'm going to say regarding you and Hard Talk, I, this conversation, I could carry it on much longer. Sadly, we're out of time. Promise me you'll come on Hard Talk one I, day I and we'll continue. You know, you know, I came once on Hard Talk with Tim Sebastian. Yeah, well. And you know what he did to me? Nobody wanted to, to interview in Dubai. <laughs> and so, you know, I. Yeah, he, but he was Tim, the nasty yeah, guy. I'm yeah, the nice yeah, guy. Yeah, oh, he's, he's nasty. So yeah, he, well. The, the first question he hit me with, he was saying, you know, first time we, we don't, you don't meet him, you don't know what the questions are. He says, oh, good morning, Mohammed. People say that Dubai. Prostitution in Dubai is growing. <laughs> See, I, said, I would never do that. I, I said, yeah, the same in New York and London. What do you want me to do? <laughs> yeah, well. But, but, uh, I, I, he's the nasty one. I'm the nice one. So come and see me. But anyway, for, well, listen, it's been a, it's such a pleasure. Thank you so much for talking to me, and I'm sure everybody appreciates it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mohammed. <laughs>